You may notice that I am not in Romans. I'm looking forward to getting back to Romans here, but with fall approaching and uh, schools beginning to crank up here soon and a curriculum that has been instructed to be taught in schools in our state, uh, parents especially, I'm thinking of you, but for all in the room, uh, workplace environments, uh, neighborhood interactions, and even fellow Christians and brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, we need to wrap our minds around what is taking place in very swift and significant ways in our culture. Um, begin with this quote. John MacArthur said it this way, The current social justice movement is more dangerous than any other controversy the church has faced in the last hundred years. That's a really amazing statement from a man who's been in ministry, is it over 60 years now? 60 plus years. John MacArthur took on the, uh, the easy believism of, of, of that day and, and established lordship salvation. That was such an important uh, work to, uh, to take out this idea of, well, I can have Jesus as my Savior, but I don't need him as my Lord. MacArthur went head on at that. He made it through days with my uncle as well who stood against together uh, the heresy, modern-day heresy of open theism. He, he has survived this postmodern gutting of so many churches that seek to, to, to make truth relative and, and, and the gospel is turned upside down. And yet, with all of that in view, he says what is happening right now with this social justice movement is more dangerous than all of those. That is wisdom from a patriarch of the church that we should not lightly overlook at all. So I prayed about how to do this, and I, I just decided the time was right to preach a sermon and take on wokeism categorically. Um, it was not an easy week of study. I, I, I did about twice the number of hours of a normal sermon because of the range of this topic and the language that I had to learn to, to speak it and all of these things. My goal here today is to show you the contrast between the anti-gospel ideology of wokeism and the glory of the gospel. I want you to see them held up together. And it's mind-blowing how opposite they are. The anti-gospel ideology of wokeism, I drew heavily from the scriptures. I also benefited greatly from my cousin Owen Strand's book, um, Christianity and Wokeness. If you haven't read it yet, get that book. It's so tremendously helpful. Get it alone for the glossary, like definition of terms, understanding the language. That's the first thing I read. And I was like, oh, now I understand some of these things more. It's excellent, and it deals with the nature of this ideology and its contrast with the gospel. So I owe uh, a debt of gratitude to, uh, to Owen and uh, his work, also to Vody Bauckham, Fault Lines, excellent book. If you haven't read it, uh, I just highly recommend it. I think it's so important for believers to have at least a, a sense of what is happening so that we know where we stand and how to answer and how to stand for the gospel in the days ahead. Colossians 2.8 is the text that I chose uh, for this sermon, but you'll find, if you've looked at your sermon notes in the back of your bulletin, you'll, you'll see we are going to be reaching all over the text. Uh, this is an, a really important sermon to take notes for, and I would also uh, point out uh, there's a handout for you to take, where is that, in the office? We'll put it out, okay, after church. Uh, some of these things are hard to remember, and so I put a handout together for you as well to take on your way out. So let's dive in. I want to begin with the question, why a sermon on wokeism? You might say, preacher, uh, what about Romans? What, why are we not in Romans? And, and uh, this is, this is the, the, the urgency of our time, and I think there's some biblical reasons why it's right from time to time to stop and say, hey, what's happening out here? And and diagnose it a little bit, and then seek to bring the word of God to bear. So a few answers to this question. Number one, confronting contradiction. There are many, many Christians, many churches that have embraced wokeism. 
They have embraced it wholesale, without critical thinking, without realizing all the baggage that comes, without realizing the gospel itself is on the line. One of the calls of Paul to the elders as he writes to Titus, listen to what elders are called to do. Among other things, character qualifications. This is calling. The overseer must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that, look at this, so that he may be able to give instruction. That's what I'm doing. And, so instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. There's a twofold function of pastoring, shepherding, eldering. There's equipping, instructing, and defending and rebuking even those false doctrines, those uh, false claims, those social ills that would seek to try to slide in un, uh, un, unbeknownst into our midst and all of a sudden steal away the church. This is something that as elders we take very seriously. Do not be conformed, as Jesse read. Do not, this is a command to you, Christians, not just to the elders. This is a call to all of us. Do not be conformed to this world. There is in a number of churches this desire to be buddies with the world, to be applauded by the world, to be known by the world as, as, as we're the good guys. And the, the harder you work to do that, the more you realize that the pressure to conform is making inroads into the church. It is not our goal to be pressed into the mold of the world so that they'll applaud us. That is not evangelism. And that's not love. It's not loving. What are we called to do instead? We are called to be transformed by the renewal of our mind. We're, we're called to stand out as sojourners, aliens, strangers in this world, for the world. We stand out from the world. How are we transformed by the renewal of our mind? By the Word of God and the Spirit of God. As we engage the Word, it changes our thinking so that it's more accurate and in line with what is and what, what, what God is and what He calls us to be and do. And then... It equips us to test this very thing we're doing today. What about wokeism? What do we do with it? How does it stack up against the gospel? Test and discern. Oh, the call to discern. What is the will of God for the church? What is good for the Christian? What is acceptable? What is perfect? These things come not as we seek to conform to the world, but as we are transformed to the Word of God, the truth of God, Christ's likeness, day by day. Another reason to preach a sermon like this, it's twofold here. We are called to avoid captivity and to destroy strongholds. One is defensive, one is offensive. Look at these passages as they come together. Avoiding captivity. Colossians 2, verse 8. See to it, Christians, your assignment See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy. Ooh, critical race theory. Right? We're, we're, we're moving into very specific commands here for us to avoid, to guard against. Captive by philosophy and empty deceit. The more I study these things, the more I realize that's what it is. These are clouds without rain, friends. That's what wokeism is. According, look at the contrast. The philosophies are, and the empty deceit, they're according to human tradition or to the elemental spirits of the world. What is that? That's satanic, right? That's dark, evil, corrupt, not according to Christ. The truth, the way, the life, right? When these things contrast, we realize that we are called to reject that which is inconsistent with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it has to be said, it is dangerously possible for you, believer, to be taken captive by a worldly, godless philosophy filled with empty deceit. 
And so you are called to guard, be discerning about the things that you jump on. There were so many friends of mine that, that early on on Facebook, I kept seeing these fists raised in the air, BLM. And I, I, I'm engaging a couple of them. They're like, do you realize what the organization is? Have you done the research? You're, you're joining publicly to represent an organization that stands dead set against Christ and the gospel. And yet, oh, how quickly fads will move. Oh, the, the social media buzz can just stir up a wave that, well, of course it's good. Everybody's in and we're just unified. We're together. That is not what we are called to do. That's conforming. We are called to discern, engage, do the research. That's the reason to preach a sermon like this. Contrasting worldviews are in view. Christian, you are called to have a Christian worldview. That is found in the Word of God. It's found on page one, and it's found at the very end, the last page as well, and everything in between. Your glasses that you understand and see the world through, that is to be the Word of God, the truth of God. When you have a worldview that denies God from the beginning, that embraces evolution, that teaches a godless ethic, you have a problem. Those glasses don't fit the Christian. That's what this will show. This sermon will show a drastically different worldview than the Christian is to, to hold and to have. Look at this passage in 2 Corinthians chap chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. Okay, so here we are. We're in the flesh. But he said, Paul says, listen, we're not waging war according to the flesh. We're not carrying pistols and AR-15s and taking people on. Right? That's not what we're doing. What are we doing today, right now in this place? There are weapons being wielded. This being the most beautiful and devastating weapon. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they do have divine power to do what? We're playing offense now. To destroy strongholds. Think dynamite. We're blowing up toxic worldviews, evil, false uh, claims. Listen to how he describes the strongholds. We destroy arguments. We destroy every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. It doesn't matter if a Harvard professor came up with it. <laughs> Frankly, in our day, that should immediately call a stiff arm. Right? They just appointed an atheist to be the chairman of their, uh, what was it, chaplain ministry. The irony. We are called as believers to destroy, blow up arguments and lofty opinions that are raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive. There it comes again, discernment. Be careful, be on your guard. Don't allow just some random thought, some inclination just to cause you to wander off into the fog. No, take it captive. We are not to be taken captive. We are to take captive every thought to obey Christ. That's the call. Faithfulness to the gospel. Faithfulness to our King. Even if the world hates us for it. What is wokeism then? I'm glad you asked. I wish I had an easy answer for you. I want to begin by saying what it's not. Okay? Here's a few things that Owen put right at the front of his book I found so helpful. Let's be clear. We're believers here. We are those who have been made to love. Love our enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. We are those who have tasted of grace and been forgiven of sin. We, we are called to enter into the fray, my friends. So, Wanting racial harmony does not make you woke. Seeing massive failings in American and Western history, namely uh, long and sustained patterns of racist thought and practice, that doesn't make you woke. 
being troubled in a major way by the complicity of past Christians in racism does not make you woke. Grieving the needless death of human beings made in the image of God, bearing dignity and purpose, that doesn't make you woke. Wanting greater justice in a world that is filled with hostility, pain, and a lack of justice, that doesn't make you woke. Recognizing you have in yourself everything needed to spew racist and ethnocentric hate and act on this in specific ways to oppose it in yourself. That doesn't make you woke. Identifying troubling or racist ethnocentric trends in one's national, regional, communal, or family heritage, that doesn't make you woke. Rejoicing in gospel-driven fellowship across all common boundary markers in this world does not make you woke. This is not wokeness, friends. This is Christianity. This is biblical Christianity. Let us not forget the public square. Let us not forget the nature of the light that we carry. We are not just to shine here in this place. We are lights sent out into the world to shine and stand out and engage in these things and stand for life and the dignity of image bearers of all pigmentation. That is our call. That is what we love as believers. And frankly, yes, there were many in our past, even in the church, even in this country, that participated in slavery. Sinfully so. But there are many who said absolutely not. We will not play a part in that. We will oppose it. We will bring it to an end and praise God. He used believers to lead the way. This is not wokeism. This is a heart that God gives His people for love just kindness, soft-heartedness. We need to see that up front, right? Let's, let's remember, we oppose evil and corrupt ideologies that are fake and false and they promise everything. They deliver nothing. But we are not opposed to reconciliation and bridge building and love and help engaging the ills of our society. The church has to stay active Yes, we vote. That's a part of it. Absolutely, that's a part of it. We participate in the public square. And we shine in the workplace, in the neighborhoods, in the schools. So, part of the way we learn what wokeism is, is what it's not. It's important to remember that. Now, let's learn the language briefly. I'm going to allow Owen's uh, definitions of some of these things to benefit us so that we just... <laughs> I remember the first time I heard someone talking about this. I, every other word, I was like, well, what does that mean? I, I, have, I literally, I don't understand what you were talking about at all. Thankfully, Vodi and, and Owen have these books, and there's a lot online that they have done in speaking and engagements. Um, so, crash course in wokeism. Number one, wokeism. You might have to jot these notes in weird places on your bulletin. I'm sorry. There's not a lot of space. Or just take a picture of the screen. Or just buy the book, right? Wokeism, the state of being consciously aware of and awake, have awakened to the hidden, as they claim, race-based injustices that pervade all American society. That's what it means to be woke. Owen says it this way, wokeism teaches that white people are racist and oppressors of others and are guilty in objective terms. There is no solution for this guilt. There is only acknowledgement of it, ongoing awareness of it, and the undertaking of certain works, I would call it atonement, self-atonement, to oppose one's nature, nature, as a white person. This, this is amazing stuff to read. It's what has taken hold across our nation. Critical race theory. It's hard to define this in one or two slides. It is the system of thought, I would call it an ideology or religion for that matter, that asserts that hidden racism is everywhere in our society and that all whites are racist. 
Let me just say that again. If you are born and you are white, you are a racist. That's what they're saying. Now, don't, I'm not saying that, okay? This is the claim of wokeism. Blacks and other minorities are not racist because they lack the power to be so. One's racial group determines one's core identity. That may be the most significant line in the entire definition. Your racial group is the defining factor of your identity. The color of your skin, the, the, the amount of pigmentation in your skin. Wow. Neil Shinvi says it this way, critical race theory is an ideology that divides the world into oppressed groups and their oppressors and aims to liberate the oppressed. That sounds exactly like Karl Marx, doesn't it? And it is. CRT is basically cultural Marxism. It divides the world into the haves and the have-nots and seeks to right the wrongs of previous generations by redistribution of power and wealth. Hmm. Social justice, this is important to know. Sometimes wokeism will take terms that you thought you knew and they will tweak them, they will adjust them, and they will use these terms and all of a sudden you're like, I don't, I don't think it means what I thought it means now. Like I remember when I learned this the hard way, systemic. I thought that meant that it was in a lot of places. No, systemic means it is literally woven into the institutions such that the only solution is to take them down. Tear them to the ground. Social justice, according to wokeism, is achieved through deconstructing white power and redistributing power and resources to minorities. The aim of woke social justice is uh, equity of outcome, not just equity of opportunity. I believe that it's right to seek to, to, to give opportunities as, as just open the doors. Right? Come on in. If you qualify, if you pass the requirements for this class or this degree or this, uh, uh, you know, whatever it may be, the job uh, off opportunity, then come on in. I'm not going to evaluate you based upon the color of your skin. We're going to evaluate you based upon the, the content of your character, Martin Luther King. Oh, how we've forgotten that. And your qualifications for the job. No, not, not, not so. Woke social justice says equality of outcome. So the students that graduate should all have the same outcome. And if they don't, racist. It's a racist program. That, can we just say, that's literally impossible. You cannot ever achieve equity of outcome, quality of outcome. Intersectionality, this is what is like the fuel on the fire, the crisscrossing of categories of oppression in society, including race, class, gender, sexuality, age, ability, citizenship. Okay, you see some of the decisions being made right now at the border. They're very much woke. That's part of what we're seeing. Oh, get rid of the borders. Citizenship, that's, that's an oppressive mindset. And even now body type, this is the newest one that's kind of catching fire if you're overweight or you're disabled you are oppressed and you need to take power from those who are not overweight and not disabled and this is marxism it can take if you take the model plug in anything you want you can take it anywhere in the world and the same will happen total anarchy and chaos damage do, do we Karl Marx is represent, he, he represents far greater damage than Adolf Hitler. We, we, we know this. The, the number of people who have died because of Marxism is millions past what Hitler ever did. Woke racism. Race-based prejudice against someone only when it's coupled with power. This is a tweak that I did not understand, and I was just completely at a loss as to how people could say these racist, horrible things. Now I understand that woke racism means that it's only racist if it's prejudiced plus power, such that an individual cannot display racism if he or she is an ethnic minority. You literally can't say anything racist 
if you have more pigmentation. Majority ethnicity equals power and oppression. Because there's more white people than minorities in this nation, it is confirmation, many are saying, that this is a racist nation. Now, take that logic and go to any country in the world. That is insane. It's just majority culture does not mean, or majority ethnicity doesn't mean racism. So it's like where you are. Now, it might mean racism. Let's be clear. It might mean it, but it's not automatic. It's not a guarantee. Just counting numbers. Wokeism is. On the back page, here are a few things that wokeism calls for, specifically to Christians here. America as a country is shot through with white supremacy that benefits white people in particular and all who uncritically support or do not challenge the system of white privilege. America as a country, oh, I just read that one. Accordingly, in the church, Christians are being called to repent for your whiteness. Let me be clear. From this pulpit, that will never happen. Never. There are brothers, pastor, mentors of mine that have said things like that in their pulpits. It's in the church. Just to be clear, it's in the church already. Christians are urged to read complex realities and events in monocausal terms. Monocausal. The reason for the problem is white people who are racist. That is the monocausal diagnosis of problems in our country. Racism, racism is the cause of poverty. Racism is the cause of crime rate. Racism is the cause of shootings, educational disparities, and it's white people's fault. Christians are encouraged to align with Black Lives Matter, an organization with a polar opposite worldview on matters of the natural family, the sexes, and human sexuality. That's intersex... Uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, inter see, Intersectionality? Is that the, this is the language learning curve. That's why BLM, with the Black Lives Matter, is not just representing black lives. They are representing a whole host of oppressed, in their opinion, and seeking to pull down. This is, it even goes to like kids. You kids are oppressed because your parents have rules for you. You need to make your own decisions when it comes to various important things like your sexuality. I'm not saying this. They are. There's no boundary marker to the oppressed oppressor categories that can be established, which is one of the reasons our country is literally, in the name of unity, tearing itself apart. Christians are told to see capitalism as oppressive, unfair, and unjust with socialism of various kinds as the preferred system. That's hogwash. That's absolute hogwash. Christians are told that uh, to acknowledge white interpretation, uh, to, are told to acknowledge white interpretation, and that is the reason the church has been held captive to a white agenda. So now what we're finding now is when a church goes woke and they embrace these things, it's not enough to just you know, try to get the pats on the back from the culture. The culture comes in and says, what you're preaching is white supremacy. You have to adjust it. Your interpretation methods are white and racist. You have to change your theology. And you know what? Churches are cowering under the pressure to conform. Christians are urged to support reparations and distributive justice. Christians hear that they should support cultural relativism and that making judgments along moral and other lines about cultural practices is wrong. Christians are directed to add their voice to cancel culture and defunding the police, i.e., the military, i.e., whatever institution 
is on the chopping block of today. Hmm. A lot of tearing down without any really to show. That's what our past year and a half or two have shown. There's a lot of devastation, a lot of angry, marching, glass-breaking, burning of things, killing. Where's the fruit? Where's the good stuff? I don't see it at all. I don't see it. Ashley Shackelford in 2017 and, and on more recently even, said it this way, all white people are racist. And you're always going to be racist. Even when you're on a path to become a better human being, I believe all people, all white people are born into not being human. She would go on to say that she believes that all white people are demons. Okay, now, kids, you're not. Let's be clear. I, I, don't, I don't mean to scare you with this. The, these are false, fake words. It's not true. It's not true. This is satanic. Hate to the core. This is hatred. This is racism. Promoted in the name of ending racism. It's just like Satan. He shows up at the door as an angel of light. Here I am. I'm going to solve all the issues. And you open that door and you let him in and everything falls to pieces. The religion of wokeism. Here's a few summary statements. Core identity is found in skin color, either oppressed or oppressor. Core problem, whiteness is the core problem and all oppressive systems. So uh, intersectionality builds that out. Solution, well, be woke, wake up. Be anti-racist, deconstruct, defund, and redistribute. That's why people, I think, have decided in their minds it's good to destroy things. It's good to break windows. It's good to burn buildings. It's good to defund police because they think, I think some of them, some of them are just criminals flat out with hoods on. Others are, are somehow deluded enough to think that they're doing something good by doing these things. That they're tearing down the institutions of white supremacy. What is redemption? This is the key piece. There is no redemption if you're white. There's no redemption. Only awareness, listening, learning, being rebuked, right? Doing anti-racist things. If you're not white, what, what is redemption if you're not white? Let's just engage this. What, what's the holdout here? What, what's the offer? Well, power. That's what you lack because you're oppressed. You need power. You need positions of employment, status, political, whatever. You need possessions, redistributive wealth, right? Take from the rich and give to the oppressed. Take from the whites and give to the oppressed. And you need punishment. You want to see justice. And so you want atonement made. You want to see people kissing your shoes. <laughs> Is this anything, Christian? Uh, do you see any grace? Where's grace? Where's forgiveness? Where's love and kindness and hope? Truth and morality, this is a hard postmodernism. It's not enough anymore to say that truth is relative and your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth, and blah, 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 blah. all that. We went there before, right? We already opposed that and we won. It's a truth claim. There is no objective truth. Well, how firmly do you believe that? Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's ironic. Now we're into hard postmodernism. It's flat out truth is racist. The work to, to discern truth, that's dubbed racist. That's a white supremacy approach. Hard racism. The claims of the oppressed are not to be questioned. They make a claim. It is truth. It can't be dis discussed. A reason, debate. They're predominantly uh, part of the system of white power, which is why some of you who were down, you know, uh, holding this, the signs and the flags and tried to engage people in discussion who disagreed with you, they're not interested in discussing. Largely, they are interested in deconstructing and destroying. 
This is one of the most hope-stealing realities of wokeness. Is literally the teaching and instructing of woke people not to listen or discuss or engage. Desired future, equity of outcome, power to the oppressed, in oppression through Karl Marx smiles revolution. Do John MacArthur's words ring a little truer to you now? It began in universities and crazy classrooms where basically socialist Marxist people have been teaching for years, like going back to the 70s and beyond, I'm sure. And finally, it crawled out of the classroom and it made its way into some politics and then it went mainstream in a hurry when we began to see very publicized police shootings and violence and things like that. It's gone into schools now. It's gone into politics in a huge way. In fact, frankly, it is so functioning in politics, you can't even keep up with all the wokeness that, that is being uh, decided day after day after day. And it's in the church. It's in the church. That is a huge problem. I have witnessed a group that I very much love be split down the middle because some have embraced wokeness and others, rightly, biblically, have rejected it. So be aware, my friends, you need to be discerning even among the voices you've listened to and learned from. Listen carefully for wokeness in sermons. Now, quickly, why the gospel shines brighter. And when I say brighter, I'm talking solar flare bright. Let's go. We have a common origin and a shared image. You have to start here. Christian, you have to start at the beginning of your Bible. Begin with Genesis 1 and 2. That's where the good book begins. That's where we start when we begin to engage the ideologies of the world. We don't believe that a seven-day literal creation is just eh, throwaway. No, it is the very concrete upon which we stand. God, the good creator, made all that is by speaking through his son words that brought ex nihilo out of nothing into existence, all things. And he created Adam. Listen to Paul in Acts 17. God made from one man every nation of mankind. Oh, there's a worldview to equip yourself with in this world. To live on all the face of the earth. Everywhere you go, the common ancestry is Adam and Eve. Having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place. This is God's doing. It's glorious. There is one human race. One human race. All kinds of glorious ethnicities and, and pigmentation colors, but one race, and that is a biblical statement, not just, you know, one of those Facebook things. Th this is truth from Scripture. The image of God is that which is shared among all humanity. Every single person who is born on the face of this earth or has ever been born shares in this image. What a spectacular image it is. Owen said it this way. I love this little short little statement. There is nothing in your Bible, Christian, that says that whiteness is wicked. Let's be really, really clear. Nothing, not one verse, and yet churches are embracing this. There's not one single verse in the Bible that says, because you are white, you are wicked. I'll tell you what it does say. If you are alive and breathing, left to yourself, you are wicked, regardless of the pigmentation in your skin. They're all wicked. We are all wicked. Which leads us to point two. A universal enslavement. We want to talk about slavery? Let's talk about sin. 
That's what really happens in this world. That's what is grotesque and offensive and wrong. That's what racism is. It's sin. And people are enslaved and they think they're free. They don't even know how enslaved they are. We saw this in Romans. Just as sin came into the world through one man, that is Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. All are sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. That's the problem in this world. It's not whiteness. It's sin. And we're all infected. We're all dead in it. Apart from the gospel. Pride, partiality, which would be the biblical word, right? That's what racism really is. Partiality. It's giving preference or advantage or uh, better treatment to someone because of the shape of their nose across the sea or because of the family heritage or because of the color of their skin or because of this or that or whatever you just fill in the blank you want to talk intersectionality there it is partiality in in endless forms of sin that can happen in the church friends may it never be said in this church that we give difference to those who are like us and and shun those who look different or have a different past. Mistreatment, exploitation, bitterness, hatred, violence. Sin! It's sin. That's the problem. But there is a glorious solution. A Savior for the nations. We have a Savior for the nations. John 3.16. It's all you need to answer the question. Is wokeism... Does it have any place in the church? The answer is absolutely not. There is redemption in the gospel and there is a Savior. It says, who was sent by a Father for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes, whoever, there's no skin color attached to that. This is redemption from sin extended to the ends of the earth. Should not perish but have eternal life. Listen to Paul in Ephesians 2. For He, that's Jesus Christ, He Himself is our peace who has made us, in the context here, we're referencing Jew and Gentile. You talk about divide and hatred and, and racism. That is, that is big time happening in this context. But the gospel comes in and Paul says, look at what God has accomplished through His Son. He has made us both one. We are one. And he's broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. No more walls. No more separations. No more keeping you at an arm's distance because you are a Gentile and I am a Jew. No, no more of that. Not with Christ on the scene. We are brothers. We are together. That he might create in himself, in himself, one new man in the place of two. Making peace. You want peace in this world? You want the end of hostility? You need the gospel. You need Jesus Christ. And might reconcile us both, both Jew and Gentile, and I would add us all. Right? Regardless of where you come from, regardless of what you look like, regardless of the money you have in the bank, all of us, one, in Christ, through His body, on the cross, he healed the hostility. Oh, friends, this is so refreshing. This is like, this is the best news. The gospel ends the hostility. Wokeness pours gasoline on the hostility. We have a powerful transformation. Think of the way that we believe in the power of the gospel to literally change people from the inside out. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed. Behold, new has come. Paul wrote that, formerly known as Saul, the guy who killed Christians, 
who was breathing murderous threats. He was the hater of haters. Violent murderer. But he is no longer who he was. He has been changed by the gospel. He has a soft heart, kindness, overflowing love. Wokeism can't touch that. There's no change. There's no redemption. There's no transformation. There's only lecture and feel bad and do penance for the rest of your life. Let all bitterness, Christians, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander be put away. That's the call. Be who you are in Christ. We've been living in that in Romans 6, haven't we? Put away all malice. Be kind to one another. Oh, do you realize, Christian, how dangerous you are when you show kindness in this world? You stand out. Break the mold. Defy the expectation. Be kind. Be kind. I had a truck driver bring some chairs to the church this week. Black guy jumped out of the truck. And I'm, in my mind, I'm just like, oh, man. I want to shine. I want to shatter expectations and molds. I don't know this man at all, but I want him to know love. I want him to feel welcomed and embraced. I don't want any tension, unspoken or otherwise, between us. See it as an opportunity to shine. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, put it all away. And then uh, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, and forgive. Forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. There is no forgiveness in wokeism because there's just no Savior. There's no Savior. A glorious reconciliation. Oh, Ephesians 2, once again, for through Him we, we both have access in one spirit to the Father so that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens, brothers, sisters. We are together regardless of, of, of your skin color, regardless of your past, regardless of where you were born or grew up. We are citizens, members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus is the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together. That's why our doors are wide open. Come all. Come in and hear the gospel. And when you are changed, you're part of our family. You're part of the family forever. As many as you, uh, of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, you are all one in Christ. That's unity, friends. That's reconciliation. We bring that to the world in the gospel which is why I have every hope for this broken and shattered and sin-riddled world. We have the gospel. We have what the world needs most. They're clamoring, falling, stumbling all over the place, burning things. And the church has the answer. Don't go woke. We have it already. Wake up, O sleeper. Right? In Christ, we've already been awakened. We have life and hope and help to offer. His name is Jesus. Eternal unity. I, love, I can't wait for this. I, I get so excited for this. I can't, I, I'm, I'm loving that this is going to be forever. I'm never going to get over this. After this, John says, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation. Think about this. You want a statement about who God is? It's answered right there. What is our God like? What is his heart like for sinners of every ethnicity in every place? This multitude is together. They're, they're people who are there from every nation and all tribes and peoples and languages, and they are doing what? They are standing before the throne and before Jesus Christ, the Lamb. They are clothed together in white robes. They have palm branches in their hands, and they're crying out with a loud voice. You want hope? 
You want reconciliation? You want unity? You want glory and peace? Salvation belongs to our God. That is where you look. The one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's our message, friends. That's our message. We taste it when we gather. Just little glimpses of it, right? When we come together, it's family. We sing. We shout. We love. The anti-gospel ideology of wokeism and the beauty of gospel-powered reconciliation. Could there be a more stark contrast? Do you see it? I, I just, I hope you see it. What we bring to the equation is everything. So don't be silent. Don't be intimidated. Don't shrink back. Don't, don't conform. Speak. Speak life. Speak words of hope and truth and love and grace. They will stand out. Our response, four things. Number one, realize a Christian worldview from God's Word. You may need to do some work in the Word of God. I, I've got a couple books ordered that will help you with this. Christian worldview, sometimes people are like, well, what is that? Well, it's basically applying the gospel to everyday life. What does the gospel do to the way I see things and understand them and think about things? We need to be Christians who have our glasses on, a worldview that is Christian, that everything we see, we interpret and engage through that worldview, through, through the grid of God's word. Number two, repent of partiality in all its forms. There is no place, there is no place for a racist Christian. That is an oxymoron that should never be named among us. Not in the slightest. And friends, we are capable of it. We, we are capable of being sinfully prejudiced and partial. And so we need to be on our guard. We need to search all of those things I read at the beginning. We need to make that true of us. Long for unity. Reach out, love, be purposeful, not passive. Number three, reject godless and anti-gospel ideologies. This is not the first and it won't be the last. This world is spun up and enslaved to Satan and sin. And he is the deceiver of old. He is the ultimate cloud with no rain. He is the mirage in the desert. And he is brilliant in misleading and leading astray and taking captives. Reject it. Don't conform. Number four, rejoice in and proclaim the good news of the gospel to the ends of the earth. If you want to make a difference in this world, you have everything you need in Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you just came in this building and you don't know Jesus as Savior, let me be really clear to you. Everything you need is found in Him. He has done all the work necessary to save you from your sins. Just run to Him. Turn from your sins and trust Him as Savior and Lord. You will experience forgiveness and freedom. You will be brought into the family of God. Turn from sin. Trust Jesus Christ. That is what we call to the world. <laughs> That's, I mean, frankly, even just saying the category of sin is tremendously helpful. Wokeism does not use that word, and that's purposeful. We do. We're Christians. We have a Savior, friends. Every reason to rejoice and sing. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for the gift of your word. Where would we be? If we didn't have your word to lead us and to light the path for us, to equip us to discern defend and even destroy these false claims. Oh, the offer is great, but it is empty and hollow and destructive. Lord, we thank You for opening our eyes to see it's all Your grace. We, we are not smarter or better or more deserving at all. It's Your mercy, Your grace, Your love that met us in our slavery to sin and saved us 
Oh, Father, help us to be humble in the way we hold these truths. We, we are so blessed by you, undeservingly blessed by you, and we pray that we would be found faithful as we carry this glorious gospel to a world desperate for hope and redemption and salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.